Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. I'm Scott Hambrick. And I'm Carl Shute. Today on the Online Great Books Podcast, we're going to discuss Friedrich Nietzsche's essay on truth and lies in a non-moral sense, translated by W.A. Hausman. Yes. But before that, fall is in the air here, Carl. It's September 2nd, but something's different. It's really good. There's a chill in the air. Maybe there, not in Oklahoma, but you'll, <laughs> you'll just not die if you go outside. So something's <laughs> different. Yeah, it feels like a uh, fall festival time, if anybody's having any. It's time to walk around small towns and see the Pumpkin Queen. And We need to incorporate a small town. What would we name our town? Carlvania. Carl's bad? <laughs> <laughs> Carl is bad. So in Carlvania in October, we'll have the COVID festival. <laughs> oh, I don't even want to think about that. No, no, no. We'll have the... Uh... We'll crown the Corona Queen with her own Corona. It'll have the little spikes all over it. I would rather forget about all of that yeah. stuff and just have like an Apple festival. Not the computers. No, just like actual apples on trees. So I had a thought. I'm currently doing uh, some precision nutrition certification for my other job. What's that other job? That other job at Barbell Logic. What do you do there, Carl? I provide online coaching to them that wants it, and I get you stronger. I got some people. I'm, uh, I love all my clients. I was thinking about uh, Paul the other day. I think he's in Oklahoma near you. Yeah, I know Hill. Yeah. And he started out, if he listens, he knows this too. He started out as a complete disaster. <laughs> we call them wombats. You know, I'm a wombat too. There's people that you just, you can't do the physical thing so easily. You're not an athlete. Yeah, just un uncoordinated people. That's all. Yeah, but if, if we tapered him for a meet, he's going to squat 500 and deadlifts 500. Yeah, and he's in his early 50s? Uh, Late 40s, about yeah. my age. Yeah. So Carl, is it online? coach, strength coach at Barbell Logic. So you can go to barbell-logic.com. And did you know, Carl, that if somebody uses the promo code S-C-H-U-D-T, they'll get $100 off and you get to be their coach? Yes. And even if they don't want me and if they say referred by me, it's nice for me too. Yeah. Um, what do you want to read next time before we get into Uncle Nietzsche here? Ian Fleming. Might be fun. I think it would be a lot of fun. James Bond. I actually watched a, a movie last night, which leads back to my thought about precision nutrition. Okay, so this is all connected. My mind is organized, even if my life is not. <laughs> so precision nutrition has this thought, which is eat less processed foods. If you do that, good things will happen. So rather than having the, the potato chips, you have the french fries. Rather than having the french fries, you have the potatoes. You know, you go towards the more original thing, and you're going to do pretty well. So rather than the, the pork sausage, you, you have like a pork chop. Uh, rather than a pork chop, you just bite a pig. <laughs> if you can catch it. Yeah. Uh, that would probably be better for you if you actually had to like, you know, bulldog a pig, a hog, and just, just eat take him. a bite out of it. Yeah. Like a lion taking down an antelope. Yeah. <laughs> Whole Foods. And I, I thought about that for online great books. You should seek less processed entertainment, hmm. more whole entertainment. And so I was thinking about that with what we do. So I watched the, the Daniel Craig, uh, James Bond movie last night while I was doing some other work. I had it on the background. That dude is so handsome. Uh, yeah, he's a good looking guy, but he's short. Oh, yeah. They the, can't have him stand next to normal people. Right. He carries a box. Uh, Coca-Cola crate around, stand on. <laughs> well, everybody in the movie is beautiful, and, and it's all well done and everything, but it's not Ian Fleming. No. It's becoming something else. It's been morphed into different things, and they're going to have a different James Bond in future movies, and it's just not the same thing that Ian Fleming wrote when he was sitting in the Bahamas. Well, was the Sean Connery Dr. No Ian Fleming? I'd say it's a little closer. I think it's closer, too. I've read all of the Ian Fleming stuff. I have only read one. Except Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. The, the, early, the Sean Connery is certainly closer. So it, just like processed food, it's not a, a terrible thing to have potato chips, but it's a better thing to have good old-fashioned potatoes, roasted yeah. potatoes probably. And so uh, the new movies might not be horrible, but 
you're probably better off going to the original. So uh, you should probably go read Ian Fleming. If you like Westerns, you probably ought to read Louis L'Amour. Charles Portis. Uh, if you like country music, which you should, you probably ought to go listen to Bob Wills, which is I, I was doing in the gym yesterday. Does that count as country music? Yeah. It's, that, that's the Western part. You see, it's country. It, we have both kinds, country and Western music in Oklahoma. <laughs> and that's the Western part. For real. Yeah, and if you like, I don't know, if you like art, you know, what are you going to do? Go look in a book or online or go, I don't know. One of the best experiences, artistic experiences of my life was going to Spain with my wife. Don't tell me the Guernica. Don't say Guernica. If I did, would you, we'd, we'd cut the podcast. We'd say, thank you very much. I think so. No, it's not Guernica. I'm not a, no, no, no Picasso. But my wife had always liked, she had a better art education than I did in the public schools in central Wisconsin than I did in the Catholic school in, in South of Chicago. And she's always raving about El Greco. El Greco is this famous um, 1500s, 1600s painter. He was a Greek guy who made his way west and they called him the Greek. I love that. <laughs> he's just the Greek. And he's these elongated figures with, with kind of weird colors, and it never, ever looked the same in the books. And I, I, I didn't know why she liked it. Well, then I got to see the original source. I got to see have the whole food. I got to see an El Greco hanging on a wall in a cathedral where he planned it to be displayed. And it shimmered. Hmm. It was amazing. Uh, I think it was in Toledo. That's how they say it, not Toledo. Toledo, this walled town in Spain. Just uh, fantastic. Is, is Carlsbad going to be a walled town? Please say yes. <laughs> uh, yes, it's going to have a, a wall and a moat, catapults. What day is market day in Carlsbad? Everybody from the countryside comes in on Wednesday to hawk their wares, buy butter and coffee. Well, we'd have to have, you know, four main festivals. Okay. Midsummer, at the, the two equinoxes, and then midsummer. Midwinter and midsummer. If you guys don't like this sort of hot, like, festival talk, uh, stick around. We get to books eventually. <laughs> but but I was just thinking about that, that Whole Foods. I think that's a good way to think about your intellectual life. What has reading these original sources done to you or for you? Two things. One good and the other one probably also good. Uh, <laughs> I think I've gotten a whole lot of enjoyment out of it. It's just really good. The The other thing that it's done is made me less susceptible to the standard stuff that everybody else listens to or, or watches. Yeah. It's the best of the form, right? Like last week we did Raymond Chandler's The Big Sleep, which is a wonderful detective novel. And, you know, would you rather read Raymond Chandler's The Big Sleep or watch the most recent of the uh, Dick Wolf, you know, law and order television series with which they've done thousands of them and it's formulaic and they just crank them out. You know, I think you're better off to go to that original thing. It's much more pleasurable that way. Mm -hmm. Even the stuff that's not pleasurable, like Aristotle's prior analytics <laughs> in, in doing that moment to moment, that's no fun, but there's a great deal of pleasure in having someone unfold it. Our seminar was a blast. Yeah. I brought up uncle Henry. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. Sitting under the tree, learning everything about the walnut tree. Yeah, so I was talking to my Uncle Henry the other day, and he's as country as homemade soap, man. And I said, I've got some black walnut trees on my place here, but I have a hard time, uh, when they don't have walnuts on them, uh, distinguishing which one's a wall, black walnut and which is a pecan. And he said, well, you know how to tell them apart, don't you? I said, I just told you. No, I, I don't know how to tell them apart. <laughs> and he said, well, you go grab a chair and you sit in that chair for a couple hours and stare at it and then you'll know. <laughs> and, and he was dead serious. He wasn't being slick or funny or anything at all. He, he meant that. Yeah, it's because you have to get the form. Right. Which Nietzsche talks about. <laughs> We do need to talk about, which uh, we'll get to in Nietzsche very soon. But you said that it's done two things for you, one good and the other one also good. So it's pleasurable. And what's the other thing? Well, the other thing was it makes me less susceptible oh, okay, to the, right. the common stream of entertainment, which just isn't that great. Can I say something about politics? It's your show. <laughs> Carl, it's our show. 
<laughs> yeah, go ahead. My oldest daughter is uh, old enough now to sign her own papers. So she had to go to the doctor the other day, and we said, well, you can sign your own stuff. We don't have to go. You know, when you got a little kid, you got to go, and mom has to sign a consent thing and all that. Well, she, you know, there's a point where you don't have to have mom go anymore, and she's there. So she went to the doctor, and, and we said, here's your insurance card. They've already got one on file, by the way. So after you see the doctor, they're going to have you go to the front desk, and that lady there will check you out, do the checkout thing, and then tell her to bill us because that's what they always do. They'll submit it to our insurance company. Have I told you this story, Carl? Nope. They'll submit it to our insurance company, and uh, there'll probably be a little bit of a discount, and then they'll bill us. She says, okay. So she goes, and she sees the doctor. Checkup, no big deal. Dermatologist. And then she goes to the counter, and she says, uh, and she hands the lady at the counter the piece of paper like you do. The doctor gives you a piece of paper. You hand it to the lady. And uh, she says, my, my parents said just to send us the bill. And the lady says, oh, well, I can't do that. And my daughter uh -oh. tells her, uh, my dad said that you always do bill. And she says, no, we can't do that. So daughter texted me and I said, tell her my name is this and my account number is that. And to look at my account and she'll see that they bill me and to just go ahead and in fact, just bill you. Well, the lady did the bureaucratic thing and ran my daughter around for 15 minutes. And you know how they do. They, this lady does whatever it is she does every day. Well, we only go to the doctor like once a year. We don't know how to do it. We don't do it mm -hmm. often enough to know what it is. Well, she's exasperated with my daughter. My daughter is a little nervous because she's never done anything like this. It's a whole bunch of bullshit. She comes home and she says, oh, my gosh, you know, this is what happened. I can't believe it. She's like, this is terrible. I said, well, that's just adulthood, you know, asking people to do reasonable things and them telling you it's against the policy and they can't do it, you know. <laughs> that's just adulthood where you're just, everything's a hassle and a runaround where you tell the guy to make sure to weed eat around the, the mailbox post and he runs into it with the lawnmower and knocks it over and breaks it. And then you have to ask him 10 times to replace. I mean, that's just the being an adult is just dealing with just recalcitrant people that just don't care about you. Flash forward. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I heard a little chunk of Michelle Obama's podcast and she said that she was out and about. I don't remember all the particulars from it. She was out and about, and somebody in the service world didn't recognize her as the former first lady of the United States of America and hassled her and ran her around and mistreated her. Now, Michelle Obama said it was racism. And I says, no, it's systemic shittiness. <laughs> uh, it might be. Like, how much discontent do all of these different political groups in our country experience that they attribute to you know all whatever kind of causes but it's just there's just a simmering low level of just systemic shittiness out there that's just grinding everybody to powder yeah i want that to meme to catch on systemic shittiness well the unfortunate thing but i think it's ultimately a good thing that that doing what we do does is it makes you notice that kind of stuff that's where i'm less satisfied with it i think so yeah, there's like there's this customer is always right crust. It's very thin and very brittle on most re interactions. And when you break through that crust, the systemic shittiness is right under there. <laughs> and you get it all over you. It's so bad. But I think I think reading these books, while I enjoy it a great deal, it's a wonderful diversion. Uh, it also makes me, I think, see things kind of like an alien observer. Uh-huh. And Nietzsche is going to do that. So we're we're doing. Uh, <laughs> see, I'm the master of the segue. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Because you go deep enough, all the thoughts are connected anyway. It's all one thought eventually. So said Parmenides. It's just thought. Huh. So I picked out a little thing for us to read because we've been reading some heavy stuff. A little 14 page thing on truth and lies in the non moral sense by my friend Friedrich Friedrich Nietzsche. Is this not heavy? It's short. Well, <laughs> it's short kind of joyful it was unpublished during his lifetime his sister published it. no well he was still alive but he had a mental breakdown at the end for some reason and uh his sister would publish a bunch of, bunch of stuff but he wrote this shortly after birth of tragedy and i when i reread it or read it for the first time i think about four weeks ago on the beach i thought i mean this is it this is just a, a real nice little summary of his general way of thinking and plus, it says all sorts of things I, I don't want to agree with. Uh, let's talk about the first of those things. 
Well, for, I want to read the title again. On Truth and Lies in a Non-Moral Sense. I'm very interested already. Mm -hmm. Here's what I wanted it to answer for me. <laughs> and this doesn't answer it. It's not about this. But what I really wanted it to be about was, do, do you know anybody, I think I told you this last week, do you know anybody that tells you stuff that is not true? You can verify that it isn't true. But if they took a lie detector test, they would pass because they think it's 100% real and true. Yes. So if somebody tells you a falsehood, something that's not true, but they believe it's true, they believe it in their heart that it's true, they believe it in their reason and mind that it's true, and it's not, you know, is it a lie? Like, what is it? Is it a different category than just a, a lie where somebody is trying to deceive? Like, I, I wanted to dig into that. Well, Socrates might say... But I, I don't know if it's a truth, truth or a lie yet. I'm not even sure what the truth is. Oh, no. Well, that's where Friedrich goes. Yeah. Well, first of all, he starts off by saying that once upon a time, there was a little animal that somehow developed an intellect. Yeah. Once upon a time in some out-of-way corner of the universe, which is dispersed into numberless twinkling solar systems, there was a star upon which clever beasts invented knowing. That was the most arrogant and mendacious minute of world history. But nevertheless, it was only a minute. After nature had drawn a few breaths, the star cooled and congealed, and the clever beasts had to die. One might invent such a fable, and yet he still would not have adequately illustrated how miserable, how shadowy and transient, how aimless and arbitrary the human intellect, because we're the clever beasts, looks within nature. There were eternities during which it did not exist. Then here's the first bomb. And when it is all over with the human intellect, nothing will have happened. For this intellect has no additional mission which would lead it beyond human life. Yeah, kind of a downer. If information isn't thought about... Well, information exists, I think. Information exists. Like, if there's a star, then there's a unit, and that's one, which isn't a zero. I mean, it's information. But if there's nothing there, uh, not a human there to do cognition on that or an intellect to work on it, it doesn't matter. The information's still there. Like, what is the intellect doing? What is the mission of the intellect? What is it? Yeah, well, the information is potentially there, but there's no one that it's informing. Well, it's not potentially there. I mean, I think it is there. Well, I would say the bare fact is there, except without, if the tree falls in the forest and there's no one to see it, well, there was no information communicated to anybody but if nobody sees it the tree still fell like the fact that somebody sees it cosmically according to uncle fred here makes no difference whatsoever because the intellect has no additional mission and this is the god is dead and we have killed him guy uh-huh yeah he doesn't see an additional mission no well he's not a nihilist though no he's not no we are nihilist sabowski no he's not a nihilist you don't like that movie do you I don't think I've seen it. Big Lebowski? I don't think I've seen it. I don't think it's a Scott movie, but I love it. So kind of arguing on the cosmic scale, a humans are uh, very, very small. Reason is really of no account. There's going to be eternity of time before which there was reason and eternity of time which after which there will have been reason. Uh, well, then what good is it? What is it about? Yeah, it, it goes on right after this to say that you know, even some gnat flying, buzzing around through the air feels like he's the center of the universe and like is flying around solemnly thinking how important he is. And uh, <laughs> we're not any different, he says. I kind of like that. It's funny. Yeah. Well, what do we use it for? So I'm going to skip a few paragraphs down. As a means for the preserving of the individual, the intellect unfolds its principal powers in dissimulation which is the means by which weaker, less robust individuals preserve themselves. Pause for a minute. Dissimulation, lying. Yeah, deception. Trickery. Uh, which weaker, less robust individuals preserve themselves since they have been denied the chance to wage the battle for existence with horns or with the sharp teeth of beasts of prey. This art of dissimulation reaches its peak in man. Deception, flattering, lying, deluding, talking behind the back, putting up a false front, living in borrowed splendor, wearing a mask. That's what we use the mind for. 
Yeah, he says it's the principle, or it's, it's the means for preserving the individual. I hate this. I'm going to say it anyway. I want to be Sam Harris for a second. Let's unpack this. <laughs> Is there a podcast you don't listen to? I haven't listened to Harris in a couple of years. There are a lot of podcasts I don't listen to. Any of them by NPR, I don't listen. I print a transcript of them and then wipe with it. I mostly listen to podcasts in which Scott Hambrick has appeared. Oh, no. I guess I do, too. <laughs> he, he says that, uh, that the intellect is a means for preserving the individual. The intellect unfolds its principal powers in dissimulation. Do we dissimulate to preserve the individual? Like, do you have to do... He gives us a, li a laundry list of of uh, sim synonyms for dissimulation here. Deception, flattering, lying, deluding, talking behind the back, putting up a false front, living in borrowed splendor, wearing a mask, hiding behind convention. Is like preserving individuality predicated on doing those things? I don't think so. I don't buy that for him. Well, okay. So you're the individual. The lion comes at you and you don't want to be eaten. Sure. And you say to the lion, you can't eat me. Why not? Because I know where the treasure is. I taste terrible. That's what I would say. <laughs> I don't know, some kind of trickery, some kind of manipulation of the dumb predator is what you have to do. Would putting the, the wall around Carlsbad to keep the lion out, is that dissimulative? No, it's a good point. It's not entirely language. But the king of, of Carlvania, of Carlsbad, Carl. speaking of, I don't know, I mean, what did Julius Caesar say? His family was descended from Venus. No, they weren't. Come on. It's the goddess of love. I don't know. Maybe they were. Kind of we are. <laughs> but you present a public face to the crowd to make yourself seem more formidable. I think there's something to that. I, I think this is a presentiment of the resentment that's talked about in genealogy and morals. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you're not strong, if you're not strong and smart enough to actually be a creative human building stuff and doing stuff and making your own way, you're going to tend to be sneaky. We get some uh, Nietzschean epistemology here later where he shows how the intellect works and forms concepts and stuff that kind of points at this. But while I think that the intellect is partially used for dissimulation, I think that it's, it's rational faculty and tool making and <laughs> things like that are probably more important and more properly defined and protect the individual than this dissimulation he talks about. Well... When we get to his stuff on epistemology, you might then question whether any of the, the truths that you utter about your tools are actually true. Sure. It might be lies all the way down. Oh, no. Are we there yet? No, we're not quite there yet. I, I really like this one. I, I think I, I wrote in my notes after this quote, um, well, ouch, because it's all about me. So he says, uh, there's almost nothing which is less comprehensible than how an honest and pure drive for truth could have risen among them, that being humans. They are deeply immersed in illusions and in dream images. Their eyes merely glide over the surface of things and see forms. I mean, that's me, you know. I want to go sit under the walnut tree and see the form of the walnut tree. A friend called me this morning, and he's a fan of the show and a fan of yours, Carl. And he said, he quoted you when you say that you're metaphysically promiscuous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, Friedrich's talking about me. Their eyes merely glide over the surface of things and see forms. And he talks here a little bit about how uh, in order to see the forms, we have to subtract from what we see in order to see the form. Very interesting. I think he's right about that. There's a form here for Nietzsche. Nietzsche? Nietzsche? Hmm. Nietzsche, Nietzsche, I Nietzsche. believe. Is that a synonym for a concept? Yeah. For him? Is it? Okay. Yeah. In Plato, is it a syn synonym for a concept? No. It is not a synonym for a concept in in. Plato. A form is something you discover for Socrates. It is not something that you make up. Okay. Yeah. So he, for, so Nietzsche here, we'll talk about it here in a bit. The form is a product of the intellect, which uses sense data to create an analogy, which is a concept in the mind that then has to create another metaphor or analogy that ties that concept in the mind to some sound that we call words. And then you can convey the sound that's separated by at least three degrees of separation from the reality to somebody mm -hmm. else. Ugh. Yeah, but I want to do something before we get to that. So the, the theory of knowledge is where, I mean, I thought that was the real value in this yeah, I think so. uh, paper, but there's more that's good in it. Where do you have the desire for truth? 
where does it come from? And he has a, well, this is an argument that goes all the way back to Thucydides. The, the, when the individual wants to maintain himself with other individuals, if you want to live together, okay, then you need to have some sort of convention on truth. That is to say, a uniformly valid and binding designation is invented for things, and this legislation of language likewise establishes the first laws of truth. For the contrast between truth and lie arises here for the first time. So you get together. You want to exist, as he says, socially and which, with the herd. Well, the herd has truth. There are things that you're, you're able to say and things that you're not able to say if you want to still be part of the group. And the things that you're not able to say or shouldn't say would be false. So that's his test for a truth claim. Well, that's his genetic argument for why humans care about truth. It's about group dynamics, which is interesting. Yeah, so the liar is a person who used uses the valid designations, the words, in order to make something which is unreal appear to be real. Okay, I'll buy that. I sort of buy it. I buy it uh, sometimes. If you tell lies, if you go against the herd, society will cease to trust him and will thereby exclude him. Okay, sure. I remember I had a, a friend, uh, Peter, scholarly guy, we were talking about this kind of stuff. You know, whether you can actually know truth or not. And he says, well, I'm pretty sure that blood circulates. There are some things that we're pretty sure that we know. It's not all group dynamics. Mm -hmm. So when I'm reading this, I'm saying, Friedrich, yeah, I get it. You're right. But you're not right about everything. However we do it, we do make truth claims and we do seem to know actual things. Even if in group dynamics, he, he's probably right. Yeah, there's, a, there's a, a lot of stuff we talk about isn't the kind of thing like circulating blood or gravity. Gravity, that's not a good example. Gravity is a nah, mess. Nah, don't get me started on that's gravity. That's a mess. I'm sorry. He says on the page before that, you know, I'm, I'm reading this in the Apple's I, books app, whatever, and depending on how you turn this thing, it puts a different page number on it. Yeah, that's the problem with reading on book readers. What a POS. It's ridiculous. Well, we have the Delphi Complete Works of Nietzsche. That's what we're reading from, which is like $2 on Amazon. But it doesn't have durable page numbers. So that's yeah. a, a drawback. So when I hold it this way with this size screen, it's page 332. He says, what does man actually know about himself? Is he indeed ever able to perceive himself completely as if laid out in a lighted display case? There are some things that we really can't know because we don't have the objectivity. There's not, we don't have enough distance between us and the thing. And I, I think that's, tr I think that's true. Does nature not conceal most things from him, even concerning his own body? This is what the saying the blood reminded me of this in order to confine and lock him within a proud, deceptive consciousness, aloof from the coils of the bowels, the rapid flow of the bloodstream, the intricate quivering of the fibers. Yeah, there, so there are, there are a lot of things that we can't really know in the same way that there are, that we can know other things. Yeah, well, I'm not sure he gives a, a judgment for when you can actually know those other things. Uh, yeah. Nietzsche's genius, as, as everyone who reads him ends up with, is, is his destructiveness. He's a really good philosopher with a hammer. Yeah. Smashing the idols, he's extremely good at. And then you're like, well, where's the positive doctrine? It limps a little bit when we get to that. So I want to go back to this thing where he says, the liar is a person who uses the valid designations, the words, in order to make something which is unreal appear, appear to be real. This points at my problem I wanted him to solve for me. He smuggles in intent in, in, in this one sentence here. In order to make something which is unreal appear to be real. So maybe he didn't smuggle it. Maybe it's there completely on purpose and then they open. Does intent make the lie? Well, I thought he smuggled truth in there. Well, okay. Well, no, I don't know. Is reality truth? Is truth reality? Like, where's, where's the truth here? What are you talking about? The truth is, here's the true statement. The herd believes X. In this sentence, X is the valid designation. Yeah, and the liar says something else, something not X, something contrary to the truth that the herd actually is going to reward saying X. I don't see truth. There's a convention, which is the valid designation. Here's what I mean. Okay, so there are certain things we all know in uh, the social media world that you can say and that you can't say. 
that will get you banned, that will get you canceled. I don't need to go into detail, but there sure is, right? There is a truth that this set of opinions is approved. We should do a George Carlin style comedy sketch about the things you can't say, (laughs) the new things you can't say. It would take forever. (laughs) True. Yeah, George Carlin had the seven dirty words you can't say on TV. You can say them now. Now you can, of course. That tape got smuggled around my high school. Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, So there is a notion of truth. That the herd believes this is a truth statement. Do you know what I mean? So there is truth smuggled in here. There's some other truth smuggled in here when he talks about language. When he says language is based on metaphor, that is also a, a truth claim. Uh, should we talk about that? Sure. I could pug down on this one sentence here for a long time. Which one? About the liar? Yeah. So the valid designation is the truth, the truthiness of the thing that everybody has agreed, the words that everybody has agreed to selectively represent a <laughs> reality in the community. Mm-hmm. He says, for example, I am rich. When the proper designation for his condition would be poor. See, he's he's sneaking truth in there because the word proper, it's only a proper designation if he has the qualifications to be rich or to be poor. Yeah, we're not reading this in the German, but he's being crafty on purpose, I'm sure. And then, like I said, there's an intent there because he says that the liar is doing it in order to make something, you know, in order that. Now, we're doing something that we shouldn't do right now with Nietzsche. (laughs) <laughs> okay. We've been warned against it. So um, that gentleman, uh, Bronze Age pervert, has warned you against this. Okay. When you read a philosopher and you're going to, especially a Nietzschean philosopher, you're going to read him and try to make logical contradictions and make a big deal as if the logical contradiction disproves the original thought. You're misreading it. It's not supposed to hold together. He's going to say at the end of this essay, it doesn't matter if it holds together. He started the whole thing denying the primacy of human reason. And now you're going to hit him with, well, it's violating human reason. He's going to say, so what? And and I'm not trying to pick his pocket like that. I'm trying to figure out what the hell he's, (laughs) what he's asserting there. If reason is the sort of thing he thinks it is, then whatever the herd's coming up with is a construct. Whatever the liar's coming up with is a construct. Truth and falsity in this case would be doing it differently than the herd does. Yeah. That would be false. And if you're using these symbols, these words, which he equates with metaphors, if you're using them in non-standard ways, lying, that community can't function. Right. I mean, does it matter? The community, the herd, they're not based on truth if we go further and figure out what truth is. No, but by using those valid designations, I think he says that they're used over and over again until they congeal and harden. You know, until they, these valid designations become accepted, it's impossible to cooperate. You know, these lies make it impossible to cooperate. Right, and the penalty is you get excluded. Hopefully. We don't do enough of that, excluding for lying. But this is all a prelude, by the way. I know. <laughs> our our four-part series on this 15-page essay. Uh, <laughs> it's prelude to uh, the good stuff, which is on language itself. So there's a, a paragraph that starts with, uh, what is a word? What is a word? It is a copy in sound of a nerve stimulus. But the further inference from the nerve stimulus to a cause outside of us is already the result of a false and unjustifiable application of the principle of sufficient reason. That your nerve impulse is actually related to a cause outside of you, you don't know. Much less how much the, there is a relation in reality to a nerve impulse and a stimulus. The nerve impulse is not the thing. Because you touch something and it's hot, or you're, you jerk your arm away because your nerve said that it was hot, there's actually not a direct one-to-one correlation between those two things. Right? That's what he's telling us? Yeah. I mean, if you think of something occurring outside of you, you don't know. I, I, mean, I know you're going to think this is all hair splitting. I can hear you, dear listener. You're like, oh, shut up. When you sit under that walnut tree and look under the look at the walnut tree, you are not in direct contact with the walnut tree. This is mediated, and Nietzsche would say it's mediated by metaphors. So the standard story is what light hits your goes in through your lens of your eyeball onto the optic nerve, which at some at some point in any description of this, someone's going they're going to say somehow. <laughs> 
they're going to bullshit you somehow. That somehow becomes an image in your mind, which somehow becomes the concept of walnut tree. There's a whole lot of magic in those somehows. Yeah. Because what came from the walnut tree to you, if anything came from the walnut tree to you, was a beam of light of a certain frequency hitting a particular nerve and reacting with that nerve. You didn't see a tree. You were happened to. Something happened to you. The one I always get thrown at me in seminar is uh, the leaves on that tree aren't really green. They reflect a certain wavelength of light. And that light's not actually green. That doesn't mean anything. It's a certain wavelength. And then your mind somehow yeah. sees green there. Right? You are being appeared to greenly. So green doesn't exist. Appeared to greenly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I, yeah. In the end, I'm, you know, I don't go. Friedrich, he's my favorite philosopher that I ultimately just, I don't go with him. I think he's wrong, but... I realize that in order to think he's wrong, I have to enter the realm of metaphor and magic, right? which is the use of reading something like him. Yeah, to to go to the tree image or the green thing, uh, his example is, how could we still dare to say the stone is hard, as if hard were something otherwise familiar to us and not merely a totally subjective stimulation? Yeah, so when you see the stone is hard, it's not a property of the stone, it's a property of your skin. Your skin is yielding to the thing that you're touching. It, well, and your intellect. Like, th- the skin's just skin. You still have to have the intellect mm-hmm. to assign a metaphor to that sensation, right? According to Nietzsche. Let's talk about your somehows. Talk about my what? Your somehows. Well, somehow you see that as yeah. a tree. Yeah. Uh, somehow. It, this is where you get into magic. In Socrates calls this the recollection yeah. and people read the Mino and think, well, why is he talking about this? Well, because it's magic. That's why <laughs> that kid doing the, uh, uh, the geometry problem and seeing the answer when he didn't know the answer beforehand. Well, how did it get into him? Gosh, we need to read the Mino in here. Maybe Socrates said that before we were born, we knew everything. And somehow you pass through the birth canal. It's so traumatic. You forget it all. And then mm-hmm. by and by you recollect it. And a lot of people, when I, when I do seminars, they, the, people don't like that. But, man, it jives with the phenomenology, right? You're like, you struggle yeah. with a geometry proof. You struggle and you struggle. And it just, like, falls in your lap. You're like, Eureka. And it's like, you didn't learn it. Like, you didn't. You can't bear down in Valsalva and grunt hard enough to get it. Like, it just, <laughs> it's like a recollection. It feels like it. And if you don't like Socrates' magical answer for how you get abstract concepts that are actually related to the thing. All right, let's go to Aristotle. You have the agent intellect, which takes the potentially knowable thing and makes it actually knowable, and of which Aristotle says, this, if anything, in the human is divine and lives forever. (laughs) Well, that's kind of magical. Uh, You could go with Augustine, where it is actually God who does it. But Sam Harris says it's like your pH. I'm sorry. Sam Harris says that, you know, there are a bunch of, you know, material, physical, and biological, chemical preconditions that culminate in you knowing that they're Yeah, well, there's a big somehow in there, you know? I believe it's Averroes that that says that not only is there an agent intellect, but we all share the same one. Oh, no. So we've all got the same mind. That's how you and I can both know triangles have 180 degrees. It gets weird. The fact is something weird happens, and uh, we're not quite sure how to do it. If you want to look it up in science, the problem of induction, how do you go from individual particulars to general knowledge? It hasn't been solved nope. to my satisfaction. Nope. David Bentley Hart in his book, oh, God. I think it's uh, on the understanding of God. We're not going to read that one. It's 400 pages. <laughs> he talks about it to go. Well, Walker Percy talks about it in Lost in the Cosmos. Uh, and in uh, Signposts in a Strange Land, the data that you get is stimulus response. But your understanding cannot be mapped into stimulus and response. Something weird is happening. Nietzsche notices it, and he says it's metaphor and therefore false. I notice it, and I'm much more willing to say it's magic. Because I think you do know the walnut tree. 
somehow you know it, but that's a big somehow. There is a phenomenon of that I experience of me knowing the walnut tree. Yeah, we think we know these things. Can I just read how he maps this all out? That's yes, on please. 334 on my weird book, on my weird size screen. I have no... That's completely unhelpful to me because I have a different device. Dumb. Thanks, Apple. Oh, their designs are so elegant. And... <laughs> to begin with, a nerve stimulus is transferred into an image. First metaphor. The image, in turn, is imitated in a sound. Second metaphor. And each time there is a complete overleaping of one sphere right into the middle of an entirely new and different one. One can imagine a man who is totally deaf and has never had a sensation of sound and music. Perhaps such a person will gaze with astonishment as Cladney's, I don't know, sound figures. Perhaps he will discover their causes in the vibrations of the string and will now swear that he must know what mean by, men mean by sound. Yeah, it's a good image. So if you were completely deaf, you could look at some picturizations, picture, pictures of symphonies, I guess, and think that and say, well, those are caused by sound. And now you understand music. No, you'd never heard it. You can sit in the pew and have that, the pedal tones on that organ rattle your rump on that pew and say, you know, no, it's not the same. Yeah. And I want to go a little further in this. It is this way with all of us concerning language. We believe that we know something about the things themselves when we speak of trees, colors, snow, and flowers. And yet we possess nothing but metaphors for things, metaphors, which correspond in no way to the original entities. Uh, here's an example. If you uh, say the word egg, just say the sound. Egg. Egg. It's a weird sound. What's the connection between egg and the thing itself? <laughs> well, in the Cradleus, <laughs> Socrates tells us that somewhere along the line, something associated with that egg made a sound similar to that <laughs> Is that what hens do in the in the silence of the in the silence of the chicken coop? Egg. Isn't that right? Incredulous, he says the sounds have relationship to the the shape of the thing or an onomatopoeia kind of oh, thing. Oh gosh, I don't think so. Is that not incredulous? I mean, it may be incredulous, yeah. but I don't think it's true. No. But I love reading about it though. But this is very important. This little chunk here. This is his epistemology in like a few sentences here. There's a nerve stimulus. That is transferred into an image. That's the first metaphor. So you see that you, the tree, the lens focuses that upside down image on your retina, and then somehow you <laughs> see, somehow you visualize a tree in your mind. You know what we need? We need a triangle and do a little ting every time you oh say gosh, somehow. Take a, everybody do a shot every time we say <laughs> somehow. But that image of the of the walnut tree you have in your mind is only a metaphor for walnut specific walnut treeness what do you mean be my metaphor when you do a metaphor you're saying that one thing is another thing achilles was a lion well no he's not no so you're transferring one thing to something which it is not as he says at the end of uh, i think that paragraph will be the next one every concept arises from the equation of unequal things every metaphor is a connection of unequal things yep my home book group, at the end of this month, we're going to go over uh, McIntyre's After Virtue. And he talks about how we have these incommensurable views of what virtue is or what justice is and so on, and it leads to all this conflict. Go back and listen to that episode. I think it's pretty decent. Achilles is a lion. Well, what if you're in an Eskimo and you've never seen a lion? Well, what's fierce in Eskimo land? I don't know. A bull walrus. Seal. So you come up with another metaphor. So now you're talking about Achilles. You two people, two people are talking about Achilles, and they hold these metaphors in their mind because they can't actually hold Achilles in their mind. No, he wouldn't fit. And there's no Achilles input to put him in there with. There is a certain amount of conflict, a certain amount of inaccuracy, a certain amount of some more same here, talking past each other that necessarily will happen because of this. Seems right. And I'm like, no, 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 no. It's just systemic shittiness. You could become a skeptic from this. Or you could become a nihilist from this. A real life skeptic. From this sort of analysis. I think those would be the wrong ways to go. But realizing fruitfully what it is that you, you do when you, you say a word, 
it is not so simple as that, that, that BS argument they gave you in high school when they drew the picture of the tree and the eyeball and the nerve connections and the brain, as if that explained everything. Oh my gosh, that, that's so false. It should be stricken from the curriculum. Mm. That's not how you know things. That's how a light affects your optic nerve. But none of that explains how it becomes meaning doesn't even get close. Somehow the brain makes meaning. Come on. There's a famous Voltaire quote that says, I had to go look it up. If you wish to converse with me, first define your terms. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. But if you adhere to this, your terms is two, at least two degrees separation between the rea from the reality. You got the metaphor you hold in your mind, and then the sound is a, me is a metaphor for that thing held in the mind. And like you said, there's a danger of becoming a skeptic here where you just doubt everything, doubt all the validity of any information. Mm -hmm. But it's a real problem, is, you know, especially when you think about political problems or just living with others, you know, just what politics is. How do we do it? How do we do it in good faith if all this is true? It's tough. Yeah, well, there are epistemological problems that remain to be solved. I kind of am partial to Aquinas on this. Uh, yeah. You're coming down. I am. Hot take, Carl's. Coming. No, ultimately what a judgment is, is pointing. So if I say this is a tree, it's not that I have treeness in my mind, but it's indicative. That's another way of saying it points. This thing, eventually a judgment has to have a pointing in it. This thing is a tree. Well, the is, does it mean it is the concept? Obviously not. The tree is not the same as the concept. Yeah. The concept somehow points towards the tree. There I use somehow again. I think that's right. But when we're talking about abstractions and there's nothing, it's it, and it's very hard to point at love or justice. <sighs> so hard. Then you become a continental philosopher. Yeah. You just talk about it endlessly until maybe somebody gets what you're talking about. <laughs> so you brought up Voltaire, and I think, I believe it's in Candide, where they make a joke. Does Candide have Dr. Pangloss in it? I think so, yeah. This is the best of all possible worlds. And you have a sleeping potion. Well, how does a sleeping potion work? It works by vis dormitiva, which is just Latin for the power of making you asleep. And Nietzsche's paragraph on this is pretty good. So he's talking about leaves. Just as it is certain that one leaf is never totally the same as another, so it is certain that the concept leaf is formed by arbitrarily discarding these individual differences and by forgetting the distinguishing aspects. Pause. So to get a concept of leaf, you abstract from oak leaf, Walnut leaf, pecan leaf. Is it pecan or pecan? Oh, where I'm at. It's pecan. I'm sorry. I'm a heathen. And you abstract from all of that and ignore all the differences is what he says to get a concept. That's an interesting idea. This awakens the idea that in addition to the leaves, there exists in nature the, he's, quote, leaf, unquote. The original model, according to which all the leaves were perhaps woven, sketched, measured, colored, curled, and painted but by incompetent hands so that no specimen has turned out correct, a trustworthy and faithful likeness of the original model. Right there, that's Timaeus. We have the form of leaf that somehow causes leafness. Shot. <laughs> you know, this is challenging stuff. Let's put it into more concrete terms for you. We call a person honest. And then we ask, why has he behaved so honestly today? Our usual answer is on account of his honesty. Honesty, this in turn means that the leaf is the cause of the leaves. Because of the way that it is. You've seen that meme. Yeah, well, we, we're coming up with concepts and then thinking that the concepts are actually causative. This whole leaf thing. The concept leaf is formed by arbitrarily discarding these individual differences and forgetting the distinguishing aspects. I'm not so sure about that point, but I wanted to go with him. Yeah, I tried to go with him too, but I don't think it's arbitrary. You know, there are problems of definition here where you look at the commonality. You, you can't discard, or you can't forget the distinguishing aspects. I think the distinguishing aspects, maybe not the particulars or the accidents of this or that leaf. I don't think that's what happens when we form the concept of leafness. I don't think that's right. I don't buy that. Am I doing what, what we were told not to do with Nietzsche here? Uh, finding logical contradictions? No, you're just saying you, it doesn't fit with your experience. Yeah, I don't think so. You, you don't catch Nietzsche on logic, because right. he, he ultimately he won't care. 
and I don't believe that it's arbitrarily discarding individual differences. The pecan leaf is a compound leaf. You know, it's got leaflets. They come in like, I don't know, five, I think, or sevens. I can't remember. But then like an oak leaf is just one leaf that grows off of the stem, and you could probably know what that looks like. Or a maple leaf. So we have to discard the fact that some are compound and some are simple, but we can still see that they're, you know, I don't know what, what are they? They're solar collection devices that grow off of a woody stem. They're annual. They fall off every year. Uh, they're green, you know, but it's the fact that we ignored that one is compound and one is simple isn't arbitrary. I think, and I think that's significant. I think that matters. Yeah. I, I want to go back to something you said earlier, because there is a real danger in what that he's pointing to where we make honesty be the cause of somebody's honesty, honesty itself be the cause of somebody's honesty. And your example with that certain former politician's wife, Mm -hmm. we come up with terms for things and then we think they cause stuff. Right. We come up with a con your concept of systemic shittiness. Yes. Well, now that's the cause of things. Right. Because it's an epistemic truth. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, but in other words, you you mistake the concept for the reality. Like um, one of my least favorite presidents, Woodrow Wilson, we went off to fight to make the world safe for democracy. Democracy, which is a concept describing a system of government, somehow becomes shot. Somehow becomes a concept that can bear moral truth and drive men to go die in trenches. It's weird. It's super weird. Got to be really careful about how we think about stuff, don't we? Mm-hmm. We did the show on distributism, and I got uh, fairly roundly attacked uh, <laughs> because of that thing. Nobody attacked me. I, I'm a lightning rod. It's fine. <laughs> because people on the kind of libertarian edge of things somehow think that capitalism is an ethical system. That They think it tells you how to act in all ways. You probably didn't see all the criticisms. Well, let, let's translate this. You you do a description of a, a country that is reasonably prosperous, I guess, and you describe what they do as capitalism. Right. And then you take the concept and you hypostasize it. You make it kind of into a thing. And you say capitalism caused the prosperity. Right. When in fact the country was prosperous. And even countries too much of an abstraction. The people in the marketplace in Carlsbad on market days made it prosperous. The abstract concept capitalism did not do anything. It's a description of what they did. It's not the cause of what they did. Same thing with honesty. Honesty is a description of the person, but we tend, he thinks that Socrates is making an error in thinking that the quality of something causes the thing. Yep. And and I, I agree. (laughs) <laughs> well here's one here's one here let me go ahead and make all those people mad again <laughs> our constitution didn't make the united states pro- prosperous or make it great i think the mainest reasons include free land and difficulty of communication all you had to do as a young person to start up your own business was walk west a week or two's walk and you had free land you had an instantly capitalized farm with no debt and you were so far out, the tax man couldn't hassle you for that permit to drill a well. And you couldn't help but just come up smelling like roses. Mm-hmm. And they conflate that with capitalism and the political system. And it's just, you know, you got to be real careful when you think about what all of this stuff is and not attribute action to things that don't act, not put them in categories they don't belong in, like, you know, logical categories they don't belong in. Is this the platonic temptation? Well, just... You see forms. I'm the guy that's going to see forms everywhere, and then I think they're causes. And maybe sometimes they are. You know, maybe the form of the good is a cause, but is the form of capitalism a cause? I don't think so. Is capitalism a cause? Look, this is the reason we read people like this. I Ultimately, I am not on his side, but he's so much fun. He's so freaking smart. I'm either on his side or I'm on Aristotle's side. Th- that's where I'm going to go. But he's chopping all your idols down. He he smashes idols, and if you want to rebuild them, you have to do some work to do it, and then you'll probably build it better. For sure. I listen to the Hermetics podcast, which is a weird, weird show. And every time he has a guest on, he asks, uh, what thinkers, what three thinkers of the past would you like to put in a room together and listen in? 
uh, to the discussion. Who, who would that be for you, Carl? <laughs> well, Socrates. I don't know. Let's do, let's go. Socrates, Thomas Aquinas, and Friedrich Nietzsche. Mm. I was going to say Plato, Aristotle, and Nietzsche. I'd I'd buy tickets for that too. Because yeah. I want to hear Plato's hard nosed answers about forms, and and you know, Socrates doesn't. In my edition, fourteen hundred, seventeen hundred pages of Socrates, and he never puts a stake in the ground on those forms like I want him to. I think that's a clue. Well, but Aristotle, who was his student in the metaphysics, says this is what he told me about it, about what Plato told him about it. Yeah. Yeah, but Plato didn't well, say As far it. as we know, but Aristotle says he did, and they had lunch together. <laughs> well, is Aristotle a reliable narrator? I don't know. See, that's another reason why we got to get him in the room. We'll get to the bottom of this. You think a fight would break out? They would wrestle. They'd strip down and wrestle. They'd have to, Oh, would that be fun? <laughs> well, the thing is, in person, Friedrich, he was yeah. kind of sickly. He'd sit in the corner shy, probably, behind his mustache. Which was awesome. Yeah, definitely. We obtain the concept as we do the form by overlooking what is individual and actual. Yeah, I'm not so sure that's how we gain the form. You have to overlook what's individual. Except when you look at that walnut tree, you're going to be looking at the individual walnut tree a lot. But don't I need to see, to know walnut trees? I can't just look at that one. I have to look at a lot. Yeah, but to to overlook the individual, you need to actually look at the essential, <laughs> which I don't think Nietzsche thinks there's no. an essence. Yeah, you just snuck some Aristotle in there. I did. Yeah, so you look at that one tree. Like, let's say there's one walnut tree you get to look at, and it got hit by lightning five years ago, and it blew the bark off of one side of the tree. You know, if you don't know about lightning hitting trees, and you just see this one tree, you're like, walnut trees don't have bark on the east side of them. Yeah, you might need another one. Yeah, you have to have another one. And then you have to overlook. I actually need three. <laughs> I don't know. We're going to do some induction. And uh, we're going to look at a bunch of walnut trees. And we're going to drop out some weirdness, like the bark missing on that one. And then the fact that this one has 42 branches and the other one has 51. We've got to overlook some of those things. Have you actually counted? I haven't done what Uncle Henry told me yet. I think you should go out there with a, with a six-pack of beer mm -hmm. and just have a good afternoon. Do some philosophy. Yeah. Uncle Henry drinks Bush Light, and <laughs> they now have a can that says Latte on it. L-A-T-T-E. Oh, my gosh. Well, you know I've come full circle back to cheap American beer, but I don't think I can do Bush Light yet. Uncle Henry was not happy about that. Latte. Yeah, I didn't like that. He throws those empty beer cans in the driveway and then drives over them, you know. It's pavement. Yeah, well, not really. But once he's once he thinks he's got enough, he gathers them all up and goes and sells them. <laughs> so <he> dry, <laughs> that's funny. Uh, when I was a young man, I used to be able to stand on the can oh. without crushing it, and then you tap the side and it would crush. But at two fifty, no. I can't do that anymore. Just put my foot down like an elephant. All right, I want to get back to the text. Yeah. What then is truth? A movable host of metaphors, metonymies, and anthropomorphisms. In short, a sum of human relations which have been poetically and rhetorically intensified, transferred, and embellished, and which, after long usage, seem to a people to be fixed, canonical, and binding. Truths are illusions that we have forgotten are illusions. Uh, he should have stopped there, because that's a great line, but he goes on. There are metaphors which have become worn out and have been drained of sensuous force, coins which have lost their embossing and are now considered as metal and no longer as coins. For me, the key word in there is poetically intensified. Uh, one of the aspects of Nietzsche that, that's challenging and probably right is that truth is constructed by artists, by as others might say, by men of power. You know, it's something that is made. I'll give you a little trivia. So if you, in the Nicene Creed, when it says, I believe in one God, maker of heaven and earth, it's uh, poetes, I believe, poet. It means maker. Mm, yeah. So interesting that they call Homer a poet. He's a maker. Not of chairs, but of truth, I guess. The language, or as Orel would say, you know, you control the language, you control thought. Yeah, clearly. I think that's my first epistemological question I remember asking. It's like, 
can you think without words? Like, what are the kinds of things you can think about if you don't have words? Like, if you're uh, a Tarzan and you've never been learned learned speech of any kind, you know, you're, let's say your IQ is you know 140, but you were raised by rodents <laughs> and you have no language. You know, what 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 kind <laughs> of things can you think about? And in what ways can you think about them? I think thought is a possibility, but it's going to be stuck mostly at that first metaphor level that he talks about, where you re- you recollect images in sequence. Yeah. Well, let's so go to Tarzan. Could Tarzan be a hero without knowing what heroes do? Yes, because he's a man of power. <laughs> well, he might see things and do them, but could he? I I don't know. I. I think there's categories of being that he wouldn't have if he had no language. And real Tarzan has language. That's why I said raised by rodents. Like, you know, maybe chimpanzees or whatever he was raised by. Well, didn't he find his his dead parents' stuff in the... We could read yeah. Tarzan I sometime. Love I love the Tarzan books. I mean, would he even think of himself very much? Yeah, what's a self? Like, is it... Ugh. Ugh. God. Even to say the words... This is... Ayn Rand puts it in her book Anthem. If you don't have the word I... What does it change? She says, in order to say I love you, you first must be able to say I. Yeah. It's a cool little short book. Uh, inspiration for the Rush album, 2112. <laughs> yeah. So is self then, you know, a social construct? Is self merely language? So for Nietzsche, language is socially constructed and agreed upon by consensus or by, not by consensus, by use, by use. It's normative. Well... Well, who does the constructing? Men of power. Then the social group would then accept that that metaphor as a symbol for that concept, for that. Or reject it, but their rejection would be, they could reject it and that would be where they get their meaning. That's resentment, which we'll, we'll do gene, genealogy and morals someday. If language is a construct, you know, this was the, the thing about the cave in the Republic. Who is carrying the, the stuff in front of the fire? Who's projecting those images? If you have to have language to have a self, to have all of these categories of human beingness available to you, and this language is sort of normative, like he says, then self ends up being a social construct. Let's go on a little bit. As So there's a consequence for this. As a rational being, so says Nietzsche, he now places his behavior under the control of abstractions. Here's where you get some of the positive Nietzschean doctrine. So I thought this would be a, a nice thing to read. Uh, he, he will no longer tolerate being carried away by sudden impressions, by intuitions. First, he universalizes all these impressions into less colorful, cooler concepts so that he can entrust the guidance of his life to them, the conduct to them. Everything which distinguishes man from the animals depends on this ability to vo- volatilize perceptual metaphors in a schema and thus to dissolve an image into a concept. So you're taking the world as it appears and putting it into nice, neat little boxes. In doing so, getting some distance from it, making it less colorful, cooler. And Mm -hmm. I, I think he thinks that's good. I don't think he does. Yeah. I think this is a decay of the human to become super rational. Boy meets girl, do I love you? Well, let me see if you fit the categories. Hmm. Uh, in Herodotus, the man's running back from the battle and he sees the god Pan on the way. And Pan says, why haven't you built me a temple? And he says, okay, we'll build you a temple. And he runs back to Athens and everybody says, oh, so you saw the god Pan. The modern reader reads that, and what do you say? You just saw a guy with weird pants. Yeah, or he was hallucinating because he was running 20 miles, or he ate a bad berry on the way. We try to fit it into a conceptual box. When I was a kid, I, my sister, my mother, and I were in a Dodge pickup driving down Old Highway 33. And my sister yelled, Oh my God, there's a kangaroo. <laughs> And my mom jammed on the brakes and threw it in reverse because you could do that on Old State Highway 33. And it was a big yellow dog taking a dump in the front yard. All hunched up. In... <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't just leave it be and right. see the kangaroo. 
Are you better off from having gone back and conceptually putting it into the box of dog no, taking thinking shit? Thinking that there was a kangaroo by Inola <laughs> is way better. We should have left it at that. <laughs> so uh, there's the conceptual man and the intuitive man, and they're different. And I don't know which one's better. My sister got glasses shortly after that. <laughs> yeah, he, he, yeah, I, yeah. You're you're right. You know, but down here a little bit farther, he talks about how some will see you know uh, Roman architecture, and they exhale exhale in logic. That strength and coolness, which is characteristic of mathematics. So anyone who has felt this cool breath of logic will hardly believe that even the concept, which is this bony four square and transposable as a die, is nevertheless merely the residue of a metaphor. Yeah, so reducing that Roman architecture to you know, proportion and geometry in mathematics is to do it a disservice. Yeah, fair enough. I like it. Yeah, let me give you uh, a couple page or two later. It's the end of a long paragraph. This is a, a note to those of you who sell the purveyors of ebooks. You need to have a convention and figure out a way to do page numbers. Well, ebooks aren't for people who actually read. Well, but they're convenient. Are these, in fact, books? No. <laughs> they're data. Yeah, they are. They're not books. But they could still be tagged yeah. so you could have a page number. I think EPUBs, some of them have it. Some of the Kindle books do, but they don't all. And and it's annoying. All right. So talking about the human being. Only by forgetting this primitive world of metaphor can one live with any repo security and consistency. Only by means of the petr petrification and coagulation of a mass of images which originally streamed from the primal faculty of human imagination like a fiery liquid. Only in the invincible faith in this sun, this window, this table is a truth in itself. In short, only by forgetting that he himself is an artistically creative subject does man live with any repo, security, and consistency? And I don't think he thinks that's a good thing. It's not how he lived. With He doesn't think of course he living with that a, repose, security, and consistency is a good thing? He doesn't think that's a good thing? Well, it might be an okay thing for everybody else, but not for him. Yeah, you know, in my discussion of the Constitution earlier, you know, I, I have good friends that uh, live in repose, security, and consistency, believing that this country is a result of the Constitution. Full stop. But I say, but what about all the free land and the fact that you could be capitalized for no debt, that, you know, everything on the on the perimeter was, you know, unregulated, et cetera, et cetera. You know, what about that? Well, then that that could actually lead you to distributism, Carl. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody's a small holder and it cost them nothing to get in them. There's almost no debt. You know, you couldn't even, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it makes it too, yeah. it makes it too foggy. It makes it too cluttered, you know? Well, it makes it dangerous, too. So the the last line here is my favorite. Only by forgetting that he himself is an artistically creative subject. Well, you know, if you want to be godlike, and who doesn't, you know, the, that's what the creed says. God is a poet. And if you don't like that one, that's what all the gods are. They're makers. Okay? Is making different than acting? They're not just, not just doers, huh? We'd have to define the terms there. But, you know, going out... You could walk west and you could make your way and you could plant your stake in the ground and you build your little shop and then 20 years later, you're the richest man in town. Well, but you had to go do it. You had to be an artist of your own destiny mm -hmm. and realize it's kind of scary realizing the unformedness of things and the metaphor-laden nature of meaning. It can make you think that everything's formless and that there isn't any place you can stand. That's one reaction to it. And the other reaction to it is everything's formless. I can go put some form in it. You know, you take a person out to a bare patch of land, two different people are going to see two different things. I don't know if you took somebody from Manhattan out there might see, well, this is the middle of nowhere. This is nothing. I'm afraid of this. Take me home. Take somebody else out there. So, well, I can put a house here. I could plant potatoes here. I could have an orchard back there. Got good water. You see, so you start to see things because you're the one that can make it happen. So, what you're going to get positive from Nietzsche 
as much as there is, is this notion of the human as the artistic creator of his own meaning. I know it's dangerous. There's all kinds of problems with it. But there's some truthiness to it. Hmm. What are the consequences of this? Hmm. Hmm. Truthiness? Is that a word? No. <laughs> oh, come on. It is now. I used it. It is even a difficult thing for him to admit to himself that the insect or the bird perceives an entirely different world from the one that man does. And the question of which of these perceptions of the world is the more correct one is quite meaningless, for this would have to have been decided previously in accordance with the criterion of the correct perception, which means in accordance with the criterion which is not available. <sighs> right. So. So how do, how do you and I get along? I'm not an insect, but my deadlift's not as big as yours. So <laughs> how do our realities map on each other? How do these metaphors and, that we carry in our minds as representations of the world map onto each other? You know, how do we get anything done? So I'm not a Nietzschean because I think there is truth. I'm, I'm comfortable with more somehows than he is. How many? 11. You get a lot done with 11 somehows. I, I think that, in fact, we do have contact with the things themselves. And I know that any explanation of it's going to be full of magic, and I guess I'm okay with that. I think the fact that you and I can talk about conceptual realms and come to some kind of agreement, it means that we're discovering something. We're not making it up. That truth is out there and can be gotten. Nietzsche, I don't think, is so sure truth is out there and can be gotten. What you can get from him that's productive, that's useful, is... Uh, I mean, if that's you out there, dear listener, you might be in the same boat. You might not be convinced there's truth out there that can be gotten. We can talk more, you know, DM me, slide in my DMs. But you don't have to be a nihilist. You don't have to be a skeptic. Yeah. Lots of meaning is absolutely created by creators. Uh, we were talking about Westerns. Uh, so Louis L'Amour created a genre. John Ford created a genre. I know it's only movies, but if you're going to do a Western, you have to have you you got to do something like John Ford did. You know, the landscape has to be part of the picture. It's going to be a character. But somebody had to do that first. You've got to create. There's some, what do they call it, blue skies? There's some blue skies out there, and you can be frightened by the blue sky. You can say, well, this is a place where I can make, I can make something. <sighs> yeah, so, you know, we, the Marcuse piece that we read some weeks ago, he points out these problems with culture and it says it's oppressive and stuff. And I, I agree. Like I can't get a lady to send me a bill <laughs> and, I, and I could go on. I'm not just minimizing some nasty oppressions that are out there. And Marcuse says we have to tear it down. And I've, I've thought a lot about that Marcuse piece in the last month. I think it requires of me that I create, I think it requires of me that I create a, a proper culture and, um, I'm, I'm broken as hell, but I'm not so broken as to think that I can't create where I'm at, how I am in the current conditions. I don't have mm -hmm. to tear anybody's house down to use their old bricks to build my own. I, I don't have to do that. Well, the, the thing about, there's something else about this. The, the smashing everything down is easy to do. The artistic creation is hard. Most people won't do it. The Marcusean elements that want to tear everything down. Well, yeah, what, who's going to replace it? What great unifying artistic ideal do you have? I'm talking in Nietzschean terms. You know, do you have that would... Uh, he says, God is dead and you killed him. Who, you know, who will atone for this crime? You've drunk the oceans dry, right? That, that whole quote, the, to smash everything that has ever been is a huge thing. What are you going to replace it with? What's your positive vision? Encounter groups? <laughs> Drum circles, man, all the way down. <laughs> this Nietzsche stuff can kind of lead to that if you're not careful. Yeah. On my page 340 in my nonsense count here, it says, when the same image has been generated millions of times, it has been handed down for many generations. Right? This is the culture. This is the, this is the thing that Marcuse doesn't like. It finally appears on the same occasion every time for all mankind. Then it acquires at last the same meaning for men it would have if it were the sole necessary image and if the relationship of the original nerve stimulus to the generated image were a strictly causal one. In the same manner, an internally repeated dream would certainly be felt and judged to be reality. 
but the hardening and congealing of a metaphor guarantees absolutely nothing concerning its necessity and exclusive justification. Hmm. So, you know, this stuff that we think, these words that we use, these concepts we carry around that we use to build bridges and airplanes and stuff with, they're just agreed upon for millions of times for him. They have no bearing on reality mm-hmm. here, right? That's what he's saying. Yeah. So, you know, you get you some Nietzsche and nobody went out with you for the prom and you get a pretty bleak outlook and you go Marcuse all over this stuff. But it's not the only way out. No, and it's not Nietzsche's way out. Well, does he have a way out? Even so, I mean, the poor guy is a... Schizoid. Well, no, I'm not going to say that. He cannot believe in Christianity. It's lost all meaning for him. Okay. There certainly were nihilists and anarchists in Europe at the time. So you've got that answer, which is there's nothing. Might as well smash. If you if you don't like either of those answers, where do you go? If well, there's nothing, you could build something. You could build something. That seems patently obvious to me, but nobody ever says that. Or no, it doesn't get said enough. You can be a creator. I, I mean, Dostoevsky and Nietzsche are, are kind of like flip sides of the coin. And Dostoevsky, probably, this is a nice summary of Nietzsche. He says, one of his characters says, beauty will save the world. I I could see Friedrich saying the same thing, although I don't know that he would consider it saving. (laughs) You You could generate an actual culture. So whenever, as perhaps was the case in ancient Greece, the intuitive man, Mm. the intuitive man would be the one that's not stuck with all these concepts. The intuitive man handles his weapons more authoritatively and victoriously than his opponent. Then, under favorable circumstances, a culture can take shape, and art's mastery over life can be established. So he's talking about uh, the ancient Greeks who were able to build a a high culture that everybody copied after them because it was, I don't know, because it was pretty. And intuitive. Yeah, and not overburdened with well, actually, concepts. Yeah, it, they weren't, yeah. That quote's uh, towards the very end, by the way. So the the end of the essay has the con- contrast between the rational man and the intuitive man. Uh, this is maybe three paragraphs from the end. There are ages in which the rational man and the intuitive man stand side by side, the one in fear of intuition, the other with scorn for abstraction. The latter is just as irrational as the former is inartistic. They both desire to rule over life, the former, that's the rational man, by knowing how to meet his principal needs by means of foresight, prudence, or regularity. The latter, by disregarding these needs and as an overjoyed hero, counting as real only that life that has been disguised as illusion and beauty. Uh, And then we had that quote about the ancient Greeks actually making a great culture out of this. I mean, this is the the realm of of myths and heroes. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I, I love this at the end. It's not all bleak. The man who is guided by concepts and abstractions only succeeds by means in warding off misfortune without ever gaining any happiness for himself from these abstractions. It's irrational. You just, everything's a problem to solve. And while he aims for the greatest possible freedom from pain, the intuitive man, we take it that Nietzsche likes this guy, the intuitive man standing in the midst of a culture already reaps from his intuition a harvest of continually inflowing illumination, cheer, and redemption in addition to attaining a defense against misfortune. To be sure, he suffers more intensely when he suffers. He even suffers more frequently. It's a long quote, but the intuitive man's the one who walks down the street and sees Athena. Yeah, what's intuition here? He doesn't... He doesn't sketch it out, no. It'd be non-rational. Pre-conceptual, the worlds of, of gods and goddesses appearing. Good chance I would have translated that instinctual rather than intuition, in, intuitional, mm-hmm. intuitive. If you look at the myths of the founding of cities, there's always some kind of divine action at the beginning. Like Cadmus planting the teeth for Thebes and people sprouting out of the ground. There's always or some kind of mythic origin. England, England was Joseph of Arimathea showing up. The Rome was the Trojans, Aeneas. There's some kind of divine origin tracing it back. There's a clue there to where these huge conceptual systems of meaning come from. They're not, in the end, entirely rational. They can't be, I would say, because they presuppose a vision of the good. Oh, no. 
and the vision of the good comes from the gods. Either actual gods or in a story. You don't get around the table, you don't do a John Rawls thing, get around the table under the veil of ignorance and come up with a culture that has any strength because there's no passion to it. And there's no, and it's not rational. There's no good o meter. Well, the good is not a rational thing. You rationally approach the good that you already love. Mm. Does that make sense? Yes. So you, you fall in love with the girl. Okay, we'll go back to Schopenhauer. The universe has ordained you're going to fall in love with this cross-eyed girl. Who was it that loved cross-eyed girls? Oh, my friend. I can't, I, I won't talk to him. You can go find his wife and you'll know who I'm talking about, though. <laughs> <laughs> and so for an irrational reason, he prefers, this is what he loves. But now he can use his reason to figure out how to approach her. But he already loved her. He didn't come to the end of a syllogism and say, therefore, I love her. Uh, Nobody does that. How good would his rational approach be if he didn't have the love behind it, too? Well, it wouldn't be very motivated. Yeah. I was going to role play that with you, and I can't even imagine how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I just came up zero. That's what that pause was. <laughs> uh, hey. Uh, yeah, I, don't have any, I have no idea. Like, if you're just not interested, how do you, how do you ask a girl out <laughs> you're not interested in? No, you, you can't. There'd be no point without any value to a statement that this person is somebody I ought to go out with. Hume points this out, that, that, that facts and values are not the same thing. You come to the situation with your values. Or McIntyre responds, you know, that to be a human is to, I mean, is to have some notion what it is to be a good human. But that comes first before you do all the rest. Passion. Scott is sitting there with his cat Milton, and he looks like a Bond villain. Milton's burning. I have a friend who got married in his mid twenties, and he wanted to have children. And he told his wife that he wanted to have children, and she said, "Not yet." And this went on for a number of years. And he was headed to his brother's house for a Fourth of July celebration, and he said, "You know, hon, we really need to have children. It's time." And she said. Not yet. And he said, no, listen, it's time. And if you haven't um, decided it's time by next 4th of July, I'm leaving you. And he zipped his lip and he didn't say another word about it for 364 days. Next year on the 4th of July, they were in his truck, headed out to his brother's house for the 4th of July celebration because he always hosts it. He said, so uh, it's been a year. Last year, if you remember, I said that I'd like to have kids and I gave you a year. So what do you think? And she goes, ha, 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 no way. He turned the car around went back to the house, put his stuff in the back of the truck, and he left and he divorced her. Hmm. He immediately, we're back to the passion and the rationality thing. He immediately opened like three or four of these dating site accounts, you know, eHarmony and Plenty of Fish, you know, all those things. Is there one called Plenty of Fish? Yeah. It's like a Christian dating site, I think. Uh, huh. Yeah, he, he would go for a coffee date before work, a lunch date, and then a dinner date three of them a week, a day, like six, seven days a week for, I don't know how long he did it, but he met a woman through this uh -huh. because he wants to have kids, you know, and they yeah. got married and nowadays they've got, they got a passel of kids and so on. And I really admi admire that about this guy, but it's also real weird. Like where's the, <laughs> where's the passion in it? Was it all rational? You know, and I've talked to him about it and, you know, he definitely was passionate about having children, but, and they seem to be doing fine, he and his wife. They've been, they've actually been married 15 years now. That was 15 years ago, I guess. Is the desire for children rational? No, <laughs> no, no, no. Thank goodness. <laughs> but you can use your reason to figure out how to make it happen. He sure did. What happened to his first wife? You know what? I don't know. She fell out of my circle of acquaintance and i i don't know it sounds like a novel my circle of acquaintance no this sounds like a wendell okay. berry novel yeah yeah i'll text my buddy and see what happened i'll text him right now we'll see i bet he'll respond you know i was telling katie king who does our you know our newsletter and uh, writes up our show notes and everything for this podcast i was telling her that i wanted to i, I needed to write up a, a, a like a, a screen treatment for a, a rom-com Okay. Yeah, we could we could do this. We could use this story in our rom com. 
No, see, this is what I want. I want her first wife to have a happy ending, too. Well, that's what I was going to say. In our rom-com, she finally gets, the first wife finally gets her dream job at the, uh, the, the ladies' magazine as the editor of the, I don't know, the horoscope section. I don't know. It's her dream job. The food yeah, blogger. Or a blogger, right? She always wears pencil skirts. She gets that job, and her husband, who she met in high school, is like, you know, I really want to have kids. She's like, not now. I finally got my home. My, you know, I'm finding myself. I got my dream job and so on. And he says, listen, you know, and they're on the way to the 4th of July party at the lake at her rich uh, uncle's house, the lake house, on, you know, and overlooks the water. And they're sitting on the deck, or they're staying on the deck, watching the fireworks out over the water, and she's drinking her red wine. And he says, you know, I love you so much. I really you know, I've asked you before, and uh, it means so much to me to have children with you. Uh, we've got to have children. And she says, oh, I can't do that. You know, uh, Mrs. Magazine needs me, and it's my dream. He says, listen, by next year, we have to have children. Well, they don't have children. This is our, this is our rom-com. <laughs> they don't have, that, that doesn't okay. happen. So next year, he hands her the divorce papers. He said, I hope to have torn these up because I wanted to. I wanted you to say yes to the children, but here's your papers. And he walks away. So now he becomes the protagonist of the story. We follow him and he goes on this lightning round of dates and it's a comedy montage. You got the wacky music Mm -hmm. and you got the woman with the broken glasses. Uh And then you got like some woman that doesn't even speak English, you know, and got lady, one lady in a burka. You've got another one. who's an ex stripper. She's like popping gum and comedy montage. Uh And he does it for six months. And he's talking to one of his buddies. They're drinking beer, and they're in a little boat fishing, right? And they're drinking beer. And he's like, you know, I've been trying so hard, you know, and I just haven't found anybody like Karen, my first wife. But she didn't want to have kids. I wish it could have worked out. And his buddy's like, you got to keep trying, man. You got to keep trying. There's this new website. You need to go try this one, you know, and maybe move to another town and date in another town. So he moves to this other town. He joins this new dating website. And on the third date, it's Karen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he knocks her up that evening to have a kid. <laughs> and the soundtrack would be, do you like pina coladas? <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, my buddy just emailed me and said, uh, as far as I know, she's still in town and dating some guy, loan officer at a bank. Why? We just wanted to know. Yeah. She's got her dream job. <laughs> Making loans on jet skis. <laughs> I don't know. You know, good luck yeah, to her. Yeah. I'm. If I didn't have my kids, what would be the point? I don't know. Even though they're super annoying. Sure. You don't think the guys wanting that loan on the jet ski is annoying? I'd much rather steal with the kid. Yeah, but, you know, he doesn't, the, the guy wanting the loan doesn't sleep in your house. Right. But your kids do. Huh, does that sound like a compelling movie? <laughs> I'm sure it's already been made. I'll have to check my Hallmark uh, uh, account. That's the only movies we watch anymore. Who are we going to cast movies. <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, heck, I couldn't even name an actor anymore. Yeah, the only one I can think of is the one that played Deadpool. What's his name? Ryan something. Yeah, he costs Canadian too much guy. Money. We can't afford him for our, our movie. No, you need the B list. Right. B list Canadian actors. That's what are all in, in all the hallmarks. All right. So Nietzsche. Oh my God! He just texted <laughs> me again. Wait a minute. He says she didn't want any kids. The guy she's dating now has three kids. Womp womp. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he sounds a little bitter, Scott. Womp, womp. <laughs> oh gosh, should we, should we go back to Nietzsche? Or should we just abandon oh, it? Okay, I don't know. You know, I love him. I, I read him all the time. He's one of the guys I read all the time. I I am probably by temperament pretty close to him. By conviction, not. You know that I, that's kind of weird. Does that make yeah. any sense? I don't know. He sees so clearly the falsity of things but he doesn't see any of the truth of things. I mean, that's a caricature, but but I, I just don't think he's right about concepts. For example, I think you discover concepts. I do not think they are constructed by abstracting all the difference. I think there's actually a thing there that we learn. Yeah, that seems to be true. I think that if there were two people on that side of the globe, nobody else, and then two people on that other side of the globe... They would both discover the concept of justice uh, somehow, a hook or crook. They would be cutting a mango in half, and they would you know, try to cut it right down the middle and then let the other person who didn't cut pick so that the cut is 
affair or what you know whatever the heck it is they would discover mm-hmm. that that was and you can't and you can't point at it you know it's not a thing you find on the beach or at the party at the lake where they're where you divorce your wife so they seem to find them they seem to find those things yeah but he's great fun to read uh very perceptive uh really good at smashing things not so good at putting them back together well, let's talk about that finding things finding these concepts so he would say that the society or the community would by and by come up with a metaphor that pointed to cutting mangoes in half properly. Is that different than what you're talking about? Well, I might even go with him on that. A lot of what he says is, I think is very true in social interactions of humans with humans. Okay. Go back to the blood circulating. Was it Harvey who figured this out? Somebody figured out that blood circulates. They didn't always knew this. That's a different kind of truth. The melting point of iron. How much metaphor is in that? Some, for sure. But it doesn't matter what you think about it. It melts at that point. Where in human relations, talking about justice and democracy and and systemic whatevers, that's a whole lot more metaphor laden Mm. than what you do in your shop. Yeah, I wrote down some questions here in this book. (laughs) It's not a book. This E thing about, are there levels of epistemic truthiness here for him you know that melting point of uh, of iron would he put would he put that concept in the same category of truth as he would the notion you and i agree upon as justice Mm -hmm. i think the melting point of iron is truthier but it might be less important for him or for you well for human relations what does it matter to you what the melting point of iron is but you know listening to bunch of political podcasts and getting fired up over some abstract whatever the issue is of the day to to be angered about seems to have more motive power among people well you know the latest injustice or whatever conceptual thing we've come up with or, or our conceptual artists have come up with for us to be worried about some materialist right now would say well the partial pressure of nitrogen why you're a reactionary right wing Tradcath. Is that what I am? I have no idea. What are you? (laughs) Short-limbed. I know that. (laughs) I don't know what I am. Don't don't categorize me, bro. Metaphysically promiscuous. That should be a (laughs) t-shirt. I'm not sure what it means. So some things are truthier than others. Some, but in the realm that in the conceptual realm that humans inhabit, might be sure they're important, but a little less important. Nobody's running on the melting point of iron. No political campaigns are doing that. I made a flippant point there about the partial pressure of nitrogen, you know, informing your views. But there are materialists out there that really think that your free will, your decisions, all that stuff is a big compilation of, you know, pH and partial pressures and potential differences and voltages and all this stuff. And wham, bam, you got Carl and he likes Latin, you know. Yes. Well, the reason that the materialist scientist thinks what he does is because of all the PHs in him. So there. Somehow. So where's the objective standard to judge me? Hmm. This is getting back to Walker Percy talks about the scientists looking and seeing the whole world as a stimulus response thing, except for themselves, who stand somehow apart from it and see all the, the strings and whistles and everything. I don't know. I like, um, uh, we, we read some Marcel way back at the beginning. Marcel has a thought that I really like, which is kind of my cure for Nietzsche. The cure for Nietzsche. <laughs> well, because I'm real tempted by him. But my cure is, uh, so Marcel has these two categories. There's primary reflection and secondary reflection. Primary reflection would be sort of the philosophizing with a hammer. Breaking stuff apart, seeing what it is. Well, actually, this is all that it is. That's primary reflection. Secondary reflection is putting it back together and getting back to the original experience. So take our our young couple in love. He's in love with her and he uses all his reason to to approach her, but he's in love with her. You dissect it, you take it apart, and you say, well, it's just, you know, preservation of the species. It's hardwired. It was the pH balance and the nitrogen in the air and and whatever else. That's why uh, Bobby loves Sally. That's primary reflection. But you talk to Bobby and say, well, come on tell me about this love you have. And he writes, you love poetry. Well, not to you, but to her. He shows you some of the love poetry. Sure feels real to him. Ode to a cross-eyed girl. Yep. (laughs) 
Uh, and uh, so the secondary reflection is, no, put that back together. It's the anti-actually response. Love is just this. No, no, no. Love is not just this. Those are a lot of necessary conditions for there to be love. Sure, there's some chemical stuff going on. But love is still what it was at the beginning. And so Nietzsche will talk about how we get concepts. It doesn't ring true to me. That's not what I do. For me, there's a moment of discovery. There's a light bulb. There's recollection. Whatever it is, there's something else going on when humans get concepts. And we don't just get them, we discover them. We don't make them up. We don't go to a committee meeting and say, what are the concepts for the third quarter of this year? We're running behind on concepts, guys. (laughs) (laughs) It's one of my favorite lines from the Star Wars movies. Han Solo makes some quip to Princess Leia. We'll we'll take it up in the committee meeting. And she says back to him, I am not a committee. (laughs) Uh, I think he's right about a few things in here. I think I'll say it. I'll say it. The fact that the things that we cogitate on, that we do cognition with, aren't actually the objects of contemplation. When I think about mm-hmm. walnut trees, I'm really not like holding a walnut tree somehow in my mind. And, and uh, uh, so we are at, at some distance removed from anything that we think about. Uh, when we speak to someone else, we're there even farther removed from it. You know, if you believe his idea about metaphors or not, I, I don't know. But I think that's not debatable, is it? That walnut tree is not inside my head. No, it's not. That's not even debatable. And, uh, you know, if you haven't read any of this epistemology stuff or some Plato, and this would be a good way to wade off into some of those problems, I think, this little essay. It's 15, 18 pages, you know, really interesting. And it's Nietzsche, you know, got a couple of funny lines in there. And, uh, uh-huh. well, he could poke stuff with a sharp stick better than anybody. Yep. It was good beach reading. Is he a better uh, poker than Socrates? I think he is. Oh, gosh. I think he is. They're both pretty good. That's why I want them to. They're in my my top three. Philosopher death match. Yeah. It'd be great fun. Yeah, it would. We might get some stuff solved, too. It'd be good. There's another online great books podcast. You need to go... Listen, guys. You need to go listen to our Music and Ideas show. And, you know, keep on listening to this one if you would. Uh, Hopefully, if you made it this long, we've grown on you. It's probably an acquired taste. It probably takes more than a... Maybe more than a show. I don't know. Uh, but send it to a friend, please. Uh, we need to grow the thing, and um, we're the little train that could. <laughs> iTunes is not putting us at the top of their search results. There are bigger shows with more backing and got more search juice than we do, but we think we do a good show. We'd sure like to pass it around. Sure. I'm actually – I'm proud of all of our shows. Some of our shows, I think, are, are superstar shows. I, You know, I think that McIntyre show is really good. I think our Led Zeppelin show is pretty good. On the music and ideas we did a Sinatra show that I think is really good. I think um, the opera show I'm pretty proud of. That should be coming out next week. Those are the music and ideas shows. The way growth is going to happen, it's too cluttered. Growth is going to happen if if you tell your friends and a few of them like us. And we need to grow just a little bit so we can keep the lights on. Yeah. It's not, not, and keep doing what we're doing. Not a volunteer organization. Uh, so... Uh, please share the show. That's a big help to us. Uh, Whatever you listen to this on, somewhere there's a share button. Hit that and just, you know, text a link to uh, 12 of your best friends. That'd be good. Read along with us. Next week we're going to read, I guess, uh, Ian Fleming's Casino Royale. It's a slim little volume. It's going to be a lot of fun. I look forward to that. We've got a show, the Music and Ideas podcast. Producer Trent and Carl and I do that one. And then in the week after there, two weeks after that will be one on Western Swing, Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys. That's crazy. Saddle up. Yeah. Go to onlinegreatbooks.com slash podcast and get on the mailing list and uh, we'll send you a little digest of all the best things that happen over there with us. And uh, here in another week or so, I'll tell you about some special things we do there at Online Great Books that if you're not a member, you wouldn't know anything about because you're not as special as the members are. Talk to you guys next week. Mm-hmm.